Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Egg Whisperer. Thank you for joining me on today's Q&A session. If you're tuning in for the first time, my name is Dr. Amy and I'm a fertility doctor here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I love what I do, just slightly passionate about it, and that's an understatement. If you have a question that you wanna submit, it's easy. Just go to asktheegwhisperer.com. Paula, my producer, will message you once it's your turn for me to answer your question on Ask the Egg Whisper. And then if you miss it live, no big deal. Don't worry about it because she'll email you the link so you can listen back later. So thank you guys for joining me tonight and I'm gonna get started. This first question is from Michelle in Sacramento. Michelle says this, I'm 36 years old and I recently had an MRI that revealed three fibroids in the walls of my uterus. It's also mildly indenting my endometrial cavity. My gynecologist has recommended a robotic myomectomy surgery. I currently have embryos waiting. My question is this, how soon can I transfer safely to be sure to have it work? Thank you as always for answering the question some physicians do not wish to answer. So Michelle, I love answering questions and I always say this at the beginning of every show and I'm gonna say this again today, that the questions that you guys send to me and the answers that I give you are really just for you guys to hear as educational and informational purposes only, not to be confused with direct medical advice. I know, you guys are probably like, duh, Amy, who would take what you say as medical advice? But, you know, I just have to say that. So Michelle, here are my thoughts. Number one, what you're doing is really gonna improve not only your implantation rate, but it's probably gonna decrease your risk of pregnancy complications like miscarriage, implantation failure, and preterm labor and preterm delivery. So I totally applaud you and I think you're doing the right thing. It is so hard to wait after surgery knowing that your embryos are waiting for you and wait patiently. Your surgeon after the surgery will give you a number and that number would be the number of months that you have to wait until you are ready to transfer again. In general, it could be anywhere from three to even six months. And it just really depends on the extent to which they went into the wall of your uterus and even entered the cavity and how long they think that your uterus will need to heal before you're able to transfer. Since you mentioned that one of the fibroids, at least one, is indenting or pushing into the cavity, one thing that I would recommend that you do before you transfer, especially if your doctor thinks you need to wait a few months, is to consider a hysteroscopy before you transfer to make sure that there isn't any scar tissue from the myomectomy. So after the surgery, your surgeon's gonna to describe to you exactly what happened during the surgery. And one question that you will ask them is, did you have to enter the cavity to remove my fibroids? And if you were a patient of mine, I would also ask you to ask the surgeon to see if they can pop a camera in, into the cervix, into the uterus, to take a look at the cavity to make sure there aren't any teeny tiny fibroids that could be potentially left behind. So that's something that would be important for you to bring up from the beginning. And then before you transfer, those darn fibroids, they have a way of coming back. And then the other question you wanna ask your doctor is, is there a chance that any of these fibroids could be adenomyomas? And make sure that they're going to treat and remove endometriosis, and I imagine they will, but it's just something to talk about so that you are aware that after surgery, they might find something that could potentially be treated to improve your pregnancy rate. So endometriosis, if you have it, adenomyosis, if you have it, it's a good thing to know about because after surgery, they might wanna consider giving you a medication like Depo-Lupron or Alyssa, or even putting on birth control pills. I know it sounds counterintuitive when you're trying to get pregnant to minimize the risk that these things can grow back. Great question, Michelle. This next question comes from Lindsay and Lindsay's from Michigan. I recently miscarried my first pregnancy ever. I was about five weeks, no gestational sac, HCG returned to less than five within two days. No other abnormalities were found. I read that most OBs recommend waiting until the following period to try and conceive again, but many studies show no phys physiological reason or increased risk if you get pregnant prior to your period. Can you help me understand these recommendations so I can make an informed decision for my body? So Lindsay, I call it the pat, pat, rub, rub. Honey, honey, you need time to heal. But I can tell you if you're a patient of mine, after you go through a miscarriage, the first thing you wanna do is get pregnant as soon as possible because that's gonna be what helps you heal for a lot of people. 
So my thought process is this pregnancy happened for a reason, and this is to teach you about your body. So if you haven't learned everything there is about your body, fertility-wise, this is the perfect time to do it. So maybe get your tushy checked this month before you try again next month and look at your AMH, look at the sperm quality, look at all the genetic stuff, maybe some autoimmune stuff. Look at tushymethod.com and angelmethod.com. This is a great time to gather more information so that you know you're on the right path to pregnancy and that you're doing everything you can, and not that you can prevent miscarriage, but you're doing everything you can to learn about your body so that if there's something for you to learn, you're gonna learn about it now and not after another miscarriage. Like it would be slightly disappointing to find out that let's say you had a translocation, for example, or there was a uterine septum, for example, and you can remove the septum or you can choose IVF with genetic testing to decrease your risk of another miscarriage. You know what I mean? So those are the things that you might wanna do as you're waiting for your period. Otherwise, you're right. There's no medical reason there's no benefit, there's no decrease in fertility or increase in miscarriage after an abnormal pregnancy is diagnosed. So I totally give you my permission and blessing, not that you need it, to move forward with another attempt at conceiving, unless of course your doctor feels like there's something else that they need to be looking at and evaluating. Maybe they saw a septum and they haven't talked to you about it yet. So perhaps regroup with them and go through my angel checklist and see if there's anything else that they should be doing. This next question comes from Heidi in Dubai. Du Heidi says, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 37 and I was diagnosed with DOR and I also have well-managed hypothyroidism. My AMH is 0 0.02, my FSH is 26, my AFC is six, which increased from only two a few months ago, thanks to the many, many supplements and acupuncture. I've had three canceled IVF cycles. The first one was canceled because of an ovarian cyst. The second cycle had to be stopped after four days of gonalef stem because of poor response, and the third cycle because of a very low estrogen level. My doctor put me on birth control pills this month and is planning to introduce estrogen priming and cetratide menopir for the next cycle. What do you think of this protocol? Do I have any hope? I can't do donor eggs. My anti-thyroid antibodies are in check, and I have a healthy BMI with regular exercise. My fertility doctor says I have a beautiful trilaminar lining. My husband's sperm count is awesome, and his balls are A-OK. -okay. And you didn't really say his balls. I just added the his part. But you mentioned that the balls method was done, and everything is A-OK. Ha-ha, -okay. I made you say balls again. You did! I listen to your show every day, and your voice has such a calming effect. Thank you, Dr. Amy. Well, Heidi, that's very sweet for you to say and I want you to be a mother. It's just so hard when your egg is telling us, and your eggs, I should say, a different story. I would repeat your AMH and see where you're at. I would continue to monitor your FSH and estradiol, and my approach to a case like yours is not similar to your doctor, but that doesn't mean that your doctor isn't doing the right thing. For me, taking birth control pills when your AMH is 0 0.02 and then estrogen, that's a lot of hormones that could potentially suppress your ovaries. My style is to stop the birth control pills and just watch the wave. Do you guys hear me say that so often? You're probably slightly annoyed. And what I mean by that is take a look at your follicle count and start hormones. Do a retrieval, take a look at your follicle count and start hormones. When your AMH is 0 0.02, and your follicle count is six, it tells me there is hope. There really is, because you're not just a number. Your AMH doesn't define you. I have also retrieved several eggs from someone whose AMH tells me I shouldn't be able to. And your follicle count is more helpful, I think, than what the FSH and AMH are telling us. So if you have access to drugs like HGH, if you have the ability to add NAD, I would certainly do that. And then the other thing I would do is talk to your doctor about doing a duo stem and just collecting as many ke eggs, <laughs> kegs, <laughs> as many eggs as you can, as long as you can, as long as it makes sense. So I would say keep trying, especially since it sounds like donor egg isn't an option for you, and then see what you guys can accomplish. And just know that I'm rooting for you, I'm cheering you on, and I hope that the next egg that you have retrieved, wait for it, I hope that it sparkles. Thank you, Heidi, for your support. This next question comes from Ronnie from Ireland, 
and you're saying, I'm looking towards a frozen egg transfer, but first have endometriosis and tubal blockage surgery. I wanna make sure I'm following the optimal path. Should I try implantation first before endometriosis and tubal surgery? Should I ask the fertility doctor about surgery process and options? What are the chances of success with this type of situation, endometriosis and tubal issues? What are frozen egg success rates? I've done IVF once with a terrible place that was money, not patient driven. Now I'm at a great clinic, but I wanna make sure I've considered all things and your information is so great. I wish I had found it sooner. This cycle, I had six blastocysts from 12 eggs on my second IVF cycle, and I'm still waiting to hear about my embryo quality. I'm 37 years old, I have stage four endometriosis, and I have scar tissue and endometriosis on my tubes, uterus, colon, and everything is fused. Full complex surgery is what's required to remove this, and they also think I have a hydrocelpinx. No clinical pregnancies yes. yet. I just want to have help with practical, positive, and informed decision-making. And that's what I call having hope, having only positive and practical expectations. So I'm glad you've asked all of these questions and the problems and issues. I don't like to talk about problems. I like issues and situations. It just seems a little bit more positive than other things. Is something that is far too infrequently encountered. And I know you guys know that one day, I hope that there's going to be a fertility surgeon general and they'll pick me for it because then I will get my way and I will encourage doctors and encourage women to ask for a pelvic ultrasound starting at a very young age every time you get a pap smear. Because when I think of a situation like she is sharing with us at the age of 37, having all of these issues with endometriosis, you can imagine this is not something that just started at her age of 37. And this is something that could have been diagnosed when she was 21 or 25 or even 30. And she could have had options when she was younger. Not necessarily, we don't necessarily have much to prevent the progression that much, but potentially you could have had options to freeze eggs sooner, use medications like birth control pills continuously, Depo-Lupron, surgery at a younger age, just throwing that out there in case somebody wants to nominate me for fertility surgeon general. But in general, it sounds like you've done things exactly the way I would do it if it were me. You've created your embryos and now you're waiting. I would not send an embryo home until you've cleaned up your home. And I know that it sounds to me like the surgery that you're gonna have done to clean up the endometriosis is gonna be extensive. Make sure you're going to a top-notch endometriosis surgeon. I imagine you are. And I would say removing the fallopian tubes as much as you can without causing damage to adjacent organs, detaching them at least to prevent endometriosis spillage into the uterus would be ideal. So if you are a patient of mine, what I would say is, Let's start Depo Lupron now, just so we can get that going. Have you do surgery with an endometriosis surgeon right away and be open to the possibility of needing maybe two to three months of Depo Lupron before we transfer. So that's what I would do if it were me and just make sure you have enough embryos for the family size that you want now, because we know sometimes with endometriosis surgery, some of the healthy eggs could potentially be removed. See, that's me. This is not, it's not like a claw that goes in when you have the laparoscopy done. So one cool thing you can do, it's just interesting, check an AMH before surgery and then potentially do an AMH level after surgery to see how they compare. Okay, this next question comes from Pooja in Florida. Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm almost 36, my husband's 32. We have unexplained infertility and we've had three unsuccessful IUIs. I've done one egg retrieval, 15 eggs, 10 mature, seven fertilized, two blasts, and no normals after PGS. Our genetic carrier tests were normal. My AMH is 2.5, FSH 7, estradiol 39. And for the last three years, I've worked overnight shifts, two weeks working, then two weeks off. I have three questions. Here we go. Could my abnormal sleep patterns affect egg quality? I've started to take melatonin after discovering your channel. And the answer is yes. It is very possible that an abnormal circadian rhythm can affect egg quality. If you are a patient of mine, I would say, 
can I write you a note or a letter so that you can get switched to a daytime shift? Even if you work a later shift getting home at 11 p.m., that would be better than working graveyard. Number two, I will be switching to day shift in April, yay. Should I wait to do my next egg retrieval until after I've renormalized my sleep? And my answer to you is yes. That's exactly what I would do. And add in those egg quality supplements, do a chromosome analysis, talk to your doctor about HGH, go through all the lifestyle medicine recommendations I have. I know you know what those are. My doctor gave me a Lupron only trigger after my antagonist cycle because of concerns for OHSS. My estrogen level was 6,200. Could that have affected the results from my first retrieval? Thank you for all you do. So in general, what I would say is an estrogen level of 6,000 is not that uncommon. And I don't think that that necessarily had everything to do with what you learned about your embryos. I feel like probably the embryo quality issue, it could be egg driven, but I don't want you to forget about the sperm. So talk to your doctor about embryodiamonds.com, just putting that in there so you can go back to the website and read about all the things that I want people to know about your embryos. But the S part is not sex, <laughs> not supplements, but sperm, sperm and not sparkle, but sperm on the day of the egg retrieval. And you can ask your doctor, how was it? Was it sparkling? Just say that and have them look at you like, why are you, <laughs> what? And you can say, oh, that's what Dr. Amy says. Um, but ask your doctor if using other tools in their toolbox, like Pixie or Zyma, or maybe even doing a sperm DNA fragmentation test now ahead of your April cycle, because I don't want you to learn the hard way that, shoot, we should have done this, that, or the other before our next cycle. Like this is a time to ask all those questions. Keep asking, keep regrouping. You know, my patients who come to me, they don't say sorry. Sorry, I have one more question because they know that questions are welcome here. They know that I want to make sure that they have them all answered before they leave. And nowadays with math on, it's so hard to answer questions with people in front of me. So I always schedule phone consults after their visits if I can't answer everything because I can tell you, talking all day with a mask on is slightly tiring. This next question comes from Olivia. And Olivia asked the following, she's from the EU. Hi, Dr. Amy, thanks to Tushy at 35 years old for the first time, I did hormonal tests and I'm horrified. First test, AMH 0.39, FSH 23. Second test, AMH 0.2, FSH 4. All other hormones are good, tubes open, general good health, eating healthy, no smoking, taking prenatals, and also CoQ10. I have a subserosal fibroid in the front of my uterus measuring six by eight centimeters, not distorting the cavity. My follicle count different months showed from zero to three. Now I have to do IVF. The IVF doctor suggested not to touch the fibroid to not lose time and go with max stimulation, 300 international units, as he says, I'm a poor responder. I want to try with low dose first before going to max, afraid that max can be harmful for DOR egg quality. They suggested maybe trying a milder protocol, which they think will not be effective. Pamera, one pill in the morning, one pill in the evening, Metapure 75, Gonal 75. Can you say I'm a poor responder without trying IVF? I should start with min or go to max straight. Okay, here's the deal. 35 year old Olivia, I would never label anybody as poor responder. You know, it's like, you know that saying, if you believe it, you will achieve it. I wanna think this, you're a young, healthy woman with gorgeous sparkling eggs. You just don't have as many left compared to other 35 year olds who don't have to see me. That's how I would think about the situation. As far as the protocol, I totally agree with you. Let's go mini because you have a smaller number of eggs. You don't need to go maxi to get a mini number of eggs when you have a mini number of eggs. So my approach would be same thing, Femera, but not two tablets, let's go four. And rather than picking the dose now for Menopure and Gonal, start the Femera four tablets at night and then go back in three days later. See how many eggs there are. See how many follicles are growing from just those two or three days of Femera and then bring in the shots. If all of a sudden you see four or five, do like 300 units of Gonal or Menopure combined. If there's only two follicles, maybe do 150 of Gonal or Menopure combined. See what I mean? Now's not the time to determine the, the dosing. Now's a great time to talk about the approach. And then once you see the wave of eggs coming in, then you can decide the actual dosing. 
This next question comes from Ekaterina from California. Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 29 and I have lean PCOS. My cycles are 45 days long, no ovulation on my own. My AMH is 18.5, estrogen 63, FSH 3, prolactin 8, and my letrozole 7.5 because of my high AMH. On day nine of the cycle, I had a 13, 11, 10, and nine millimeter follicles. I'm asking my doctor if there's anything else I could do differently to help them grow because previously on Clomid, it did not grow after 12 millimeters. What would you recommend? I take Vitex, vitamin D, omega-3, eating healthy. So Ekaterina, here's the deal. I've, I've had patients who have lean PCOS. I would have never thought that their testosterone would be elevated. And bam, testosterone through the roof. I can promise you that women who have a high testosterone level don't respond as well and are more resistant to Clomid and Femera. So if you're a patient of mine, I would check your testosterone level and see where we're at. I would treat it first with more natural supplements like Ovacetol, Lipoic Acid, and Acetylcysteine. They work really, really well. And then I would try and stimulate your ovaries in order to get your ovaries to listen to me because I, I literally, I, I take the pictures. I'll give you an example of what I do every day. I go like this, I go, grow. Like I talk, I'm like, grow. And, and, and sometimes it works. <laughs> but in general, in patients who have Clomid resistant PCOS, I say, there's no ovary that won't talk to me with that. I have all sorts of little uh, tools in my toolbox, like naltrexone, dexamethasone, Femera you're taking. So those are my little, uh, my, that's part of my secret PCOS. Listen to Amy sauce that I use in my PCOS patients. And you can do other things. You can take Clomid and Femera together. You can actually do 10 days of Femera. There's so many cool ways to get your ovaries to grow. So don't worry about it. Easy for me to say, I know, but I feel like you're gonna find a, the right recipe. And that recipe is something that will hopefully work repeatedly for more babies to come. This next question is from Brittany in Canada. I'm 30 and struggling with secondary infertility. Originally unexplained, turned into low ovarian reserve. My AMH is at 3.9 and they say they want it above 10. Guys, this is Canadian units. And estrogen is too high at 276. Other than that, everything else is normal. I'm healthy, in good shape. They're recommending I go into IUI or IVF, which I'm just shocked about, especially because of my antral follicle count. They said it looked normal for my age. And I'm just hoping for a second opinion on if I should jump into IUI or IVF. We've been trying for about a year and a half now. Thank you so much. You're the absolute best resource I've found thus far in my journey. Brittany, thank you for the compliment. I really aim, no pun intended, Amy, get it, to please. So there's a reason why your doctors are feeling like they want to encourage you to do IVF. And I think the reason is your ovarian reserve is on the lower end, although I'm not feeling like there's some sort of egg cliff that you're standing at. I feel like after one and a half years of trying, given your young age, I want you to take advantage of what you still have. And so if they're saying, I want you to be as aggressive as you feel comfortable being, and you're like, I don't want to do IVF, I think that's okay. But if IVF is something that you would consider in the future, this is the perfect time to do it. Now is the time. The other stuff, you can still do that. You can still try fertility pills, like ovulation induction is what we call it, with insemination, and the other term we use is IUI. You can still do that, but I would say if they're encouraging you to do IVF, I imagine they feel like your ovarian reserve is something that is precious, and maybe they're like me. I tell my patients, I'm going to be very bossy right now. I'm going to tell you exactly what I would do if it were me, but in your case, it feels like if it's been a year and a half and your fertility levels are low, you know my saying, diagnosis before treatment, that's the egg whisper away. I know, that sounds really cheesy. But given that your diagnosis is decreased ovarian reserve, IVF and recruiting as many eggs as you can to extract and create embryos from is a great strategy and approach. Do you have to do it? No. Can you do that with fertility pills? Yes. But in some places, I'm not sure how aggressive they are, quote unquote, allowed to be to get you to ovulate more eggs for insemination cycles. And be sure to take CoQ10 if you aren't already, be sure to go through all that egg quality stuff that I'm always talking about, like taking other supplements like NAD. This next question comes from Mina. Mina is in the USA. 
I am 40 now and I have no kids. I did seven rounds of IVF during the past year until November of 2020. I had four failed with conventional IVF, high doses, and three successful IVF lights that use Clomid with Menopure only in HGH, which gave me one normal embryo each time. Total is three. I have three normal embryos, a 4AA, a 3AB, and a 5BB. I want to have two kids. Now, since December 2020, I was on a mock ERA cycle and receptiva cycle, as you recommended on the show. The doctor used a medicated cycle protocol, estrogen for 14 days, then progesterone, and I ovulated twice for this protocol. Now the doctor put me into another stronger medicated protocol to suppress my ovaries more by using birth control pills for 11 days, added 10 units of Lupron later on, continuing 14 days, and now I'm taking estrogen again with five units of Lupron. I'd like to know if this is a good protocol. Is the success rate okay? Do you think a natural cycle protocol would be better? So let's talk about belts and suspenders. When you wear a belt and your pants still fall off, you can put on suspenders and your pants are still gonna look good. <laughs> I didn't just come up with that analogy, but the pants looking good part I just came up with. And my point is if you still need suspenders, that's okay. You're gonna be fine. And that is a great way of doing a frozen embryo transfer cycle. Those are tools that we use to to have your ovaries not get in the way because we want to take over your cycle we want to control exactly when you start progesterone and that's what lupron can do for you so absolutely i would have done the exact same thing that your doctor is doing as well and congrats on having those three embryos and holy smoke seven rounds of ivf to get three you're definitely a warrior with lots of strength and resilience and good for you for doing this work this next question comes from rose Rose in the EU. Hi, Dr. Amy. Thanks for your shows. You always say that it's important to find an IVF doctor that believes in your fertility. I'm planning to start an IVF cycle. I'm 35 with decreased ovarian reserve. My AMH is 0.4, FSH 4, follicle count 4. Large asymptomatic subsurcial fibroid in the front of my uterus, 8 by 9 centimeters. Tubes are open. Lining's good. I want to do PGS testing because of my age and DOR. But the consultation with the only IVF clinic reachable to me that can do PGS was not good. They want to use max dose for cycle one, and if not successful, suggest use donor egg. Had a second consultation with them as well, but they suggested using lower doses that were maybe or probably not going to give me my IVF pyramid too. They're known as the best clinic in the area. How do I trust and start IVF with them? Should I go with a less known clinic without PGS? They don't test eggs from other clinics. Hmm, that's really tough. So here's the thing. My thought process is in a case like yours, I do think that if you can do genetic testing of your embryos, that might be important because banking your embryos because you're so young and knowing how many you could potentially have reserved for the future, that would be important to me. I think it's really hard to have untested embryos sitting there and you're just not knowing, like, should I do more cycles? Should I do less? How many will actually help me, you know, have the family size that I want? However, if you find that the doctor that you're working with in the less known clinic you feel more comfortable with, easy compromise would be to do another cycle of IVF to bank more embryos, knowing that they're not going to be tested. And I think that's okay too. I wish I had the exact answer for you. Like, have me call them. Tell me their names. <laughs> I'll see what I think. But at the end of the day, you have to listen to your gut or your ovaries or your uterus and see what they tell you about the different clinics that you're going to. And for a follicle count of four, I do think that doing a mini approach makes more sense than blasting your ovaries with hormones. We can't turn four eggs into eight, but we can certainly turn four follicles into four mature eggs, ideally. But sometimes that four turns into one or two mature eggs, which, turn, which turns into zero to one blastocyst, but really it's up to you to raise the white flag and say, I'm ready for donor egg. But a 35 year old with four follicles to me just means lots of hope, many chances. And even if IVF didn't work, consider other options like IUI. However, with this large fibroid at the front of your uterus measuring almost nine centimeters, I have to tell you my rule of fives. I've got lots of rules. But lots of rules of fives too, but my rule of fives has to do with fibroid sizes. If a fibroid is five centimeters or larger in the uterus, I ask my patients to consider removing it first. If the fibroid is within five millimeters of the cavity, I do the same. 
The thing is there's a rule of thirds <laughs> when it comes to fibroids. A third of fibroids stay the same or get, and then a third get bigger and a third gets smaller. So two thirds of the time it's either gonna stay the same or shrink, but that one third when that fibroid gets bigger, it can cause a ruckus in your uterus. And that would really suck for you to have worked so hard to make an embryo and then to find out that it turned into an abnormal pregnancy or you miscarried or had even worse preterm labor and delivery before viability because of the darn fibroid growing. So my thought in a case like yours would be to do the IVF now, freeze the embryos and bank them, and then consider removing the fibroid before you transfer. So that would be my advice to you. This next question is from Sharna from Florida. I hope all is well. I was told I have diminished ovarian reserve, which I've accepted. However, from watching and listening to other doctors, they mentioned some blood tests I should have done, but I've not gotten them done through my current fertility doctor, Blood work like prolactin, CMV, antithyroglobulin antibody, anticardiolipin antibody. I requested these from my doctor and he basically dismisses me. Can I get these done on my own without a doctor's order? So Sharna, there's a reason why tushy method isn't like tushy with a C or tushy with an anti I'm just being a smart aleck. So in general, I'll just tell you my approach. The hormones that we check as part of the checklist, the H, does include prolactin. CMB, I don't think patients need it. However, I'm not sure why you think you need it. So have a conversation with your doctor. It's really important to have that open dialogue as to why you think you need it. Antithyroid globulin and, and uh, anticardiolipin antibodies, that's part of my angel method for people who've had more than one miscarriage. However, if you told me, you know, Amy, my sister's had several miscarriages, there's a history of autoimmune issues in the family or Every woman in my family has a thyroid disorder and your TSH, let's say, is like 4.3, then absolutely I would do more testing on your thyroid. But in general, I don't think you need to start doing those tests in a case like yours based on what you've shared with me. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. So listen to your heart. And if you feel like you need those tests, there are companies out there like Quest. I think it's like um, th there are consumer direct ways to order whatever test you want through Quest Diagnostics and LabCorp, you can just, I think you can just find it on Google and then, you know, go to that website and click on it and you just find the cash price and you can order it for yourself. This next question comes from Pilar in the US. Hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for helping us so much. I'm 44 and my husband's 53. After five failed IVF cycles, we're going to use donor eggs. I'm planning to ask my doctor for a sperm DNA fragmentation test. What can a man do to improve the sperm quality? Thank you so much. Okay, here we go. Sleep well, at least eight hours per night. Do a massage for you every single day. Sorry, um, feed you <laughs> and prepare foods that are extremely healthy, rich in antioxidants that are considered anti-inflammatory foods. And while he's at it, he can eat them too. Avoid heat exposure. So while you're in the hot tub sipping cocktails, He's giving you massages and doing squats. So he's exercising at the same time, most days of the week. Get it? So we want him to exercise most days of the week. Practicing mindfulness, doing little micro meditations and deep breathing to decrease stress is super, super important as well. And you guys all know, you've heard me say before, say no to hard liquor and gummy bears. And when I mean gummy bears, I don't mean cute little gummy bears that you can buy at the gas station. I mean those gummy bears that have things like THC in them and anything that you can smoke, like vaping or cigarettes, anything that has nicotine in it, stay away from it. But making sure your body size is normal, you're following a really healthy diet, you can take supplements as well, but at the end of the day, the diet is probably the most important thing. That's how I would get sperm to sparkle. Next question is from Carmen. Carmen is from Dallas. Good morning, Dr. Amy. I absolutely love how forthcoming, informative, and kind you are. Your YouTube channel has helped me so much. I'm 41, relatively new to IVF. I did one cycle that didn't work. I had about six follicles growing. I ovulated early and they triggered right away, plus converted me to a day three fresh transfer only after three eggs were retrieved and one fertilized. This cycle, I'm with a different clinic due to affordability and they're suggesting I start Lupron to keep me from ovulating early. I'm to start stems this week. My concern is the previous doctor had me on birth control pills and I believe that suppressed my ovaries from making more eggs that I potentially could have. Could Lupron do the same thing of hindering follicles? My AMH is 1.4. I'm leaning toward not taking the Lupron. Just would like to get the most out of my cycle since I'll be 42 this summer. Any advice you would have would be greatly appreciated. So Carmen, here's the thing. I would repeat your AMH. Let's see what it is. 
consider doing an FSH ester dial if you can. And in cases where I have a patient that does that to me, where she wants to ovulate early, I still like the control that I get from an antagonist, the Ganerolix, because then I can actually double dose it and even do it twice a day. The other thing that you can do is use Lupron just in the beginning for just a little bit, and then you stop it, and then you switch the antagonist so you're not over-suppressing yourself. There are lots of ways of, lots of fun ways of doing things. Um, so I like to not use Lupron before stem start because I actually like in my decrease, I hate the word decrease. So I, I'm just using that as a, as a term because everyone understands what that means. But in my patients, who still have sparkling eggs, but maybe not that many, I like to use a combination of Lupron with HCG as part of their trigger. And if you've already taken Lupron during the cycle, you can't also use Lupron to trigger ovulation. It just doesn't work that way. You can't be taking Lupron, 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 and then take Lupron again to trigger ovulation, okay? So other thing to maybe consider doing is a mid-luteal phase stimulation. See if your doctor would consider that. Take a look at the number of follicles you have right after ovulation and compare that to the number of follicles that you typically have had at period start. And then you can compare those numbers and see if it makes sense for you to start then or wait a little bit longer. Also consider taking HGH if you can and all those egg quality supplements that I'm always talking about. This next question comes from Diane in Japan. Hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for your help. I am suffering from recurrent miscarriages, five so far and two chemical pregnancies. I have a son conceived in my 30s, no issues. Now it's been two years and three miscarriages later. Never did any fertility treatments before, but I have focal adenomyosis. And my doctor says it's small and not the issue. I have had a recurrent pregnancy loss panel done. Everything came back normal. I'm thinking of using Claritin Benadryl once a day to calm my immune system. My husband's sperm is normal and he's 35. What? is your protocol for recurrent miscarriages without any apparent reason? Can focal adenomyosis cause inflammation? What tests can I do to find out more about possible causes? My first miscarriages were in my 20s and I started to conceive again at 36 years old. I'm really sorry. And let me just see here. I just wanna make sure that I'm not missing a question here. So. I'll just say that, first of all, I'm very sorry for all that you've gone through. Secondary infertility is one of the hardest things that women can suffer through. And so my heart hurts for you. Also dealing with the miscarriages is very, very painful. But there are definitely tests that you can consider doing. I don't necessarily think we know the whole story yet based on what you've shared. It seems like checking your fallopian tubes would make sense to me to see if there's a hydrosulfing. So that's number one. I don't know how far along you got in your miscarriages, so I bring that up in case they were ectopic pregnancies or biochemicals is what I meant to say. The thing is when you have adenomyosis, there's also a higher chance that you could have endometriosis, so that's why I'm bringing that up. Endometriosis can also decrease egg quality, so that's also what I'm thinking here. And the truth of the matter is this. Adenomyosis can increase your risk of having miscarriages. So even if an embryo has normal chromosomes, you put it into a uterus and someone who has adenomyosis, they could potentially have a lower implantation rate and a higher risk of miscarriage. And that's just heartbreaking because adenomyosis is one of those things that is so hard to fix once you have it. The tools that we have, they kind of suck. And the reason why I say that is because the side effects can be so horrible. So Depo-Lupron is what I'm talking about. It can cause hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, anxiety. The list goes on and on. So my thought process is check your AMH and let's see what's going on. AMH will tell us about your egg quality mm, a little bit and count. The FSH estradiol will guide us a little bit more about egg quality. Maybe consider doing a pelvic MRI to get a full understanding of what's going on with your uterus an HSG to look at the cavity and the tubes, and do all the genetic testing that I often talk about. Chromosome analysis for you and your husband, carrier screen for you to rule out, for example, thrombophilias in the carrier screen test that I do for my patients, factor V light in, prothrombin gene mutation, that's all in there. And then I would keep trying and consider doing IVF so that you can preserve embryos, bank them, not because we think that your embryos will be abnormal so that we can treat your adenomyosis, right? So freeze the embryos, then take a couple months of Depo-Lupron and then transfer. And you might have a higher chance of pregnancy. 
and perhaps consider doing a laparoscopy hysteroscopy before you do so. Okay, this next question is from Teresa in Los Angeles. I'm 36 years old. I'll be 37 in April, and I've had two pregnancies. I was pregnant in November of 2019 and September 2020, and both resulted in miscarriages. I was told it was due to chromosomal abnormalities, and I feel so lost due to clo Clomid. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you guys hear me just say that? I said lost due to Clomid. I meant COVID. It has delayed my testing and exams, and I feel like I can see the hourglass just dwindling. To top it off, my fertility doctor has not provided the best care for me as far as helping me understand my test results and next steps. Based on my info below, what would you recommend? I have to, time to keep trying naturally. Do I have time to keep trying naturally or should I strongly consider IVF? My tests are as follows. FSH 12.6, AMH January 2021, 0.35, uterus normal cavity, fallopian tubes, normal filling of both, there's prompt spill on both sides. I'm waiting for my rainbow babies, Teresa. Okay, so Teresa, you're 36, almost 37. My birthday is April 25th. So you said your birthday's in April. So maybe we have the same birthday. Wouldn't that be cool? Okay, so back to the fertility business. When women have low egg counts, and that's what you have with the high FSH and low AMH, the way I think about it is this could be the reason why you're not successful so far but it doesn't have to be the reason why you won't be successful. When we do IVF, we can recruit the entire cohort of eggs and actually create embryos. And sometimes it takes, for example, growing four eggs to be able to get one healthy embryo. Your AMH suggests to me that you'd probably be getting around four eggs per cycle. Go get them. Eventually it's gonna be no eggs. It happens to everybody. But right now you're young, you're 36, almost 37. This is the perfect time to take supplements to support your egg quality. Talk to your doctor and get other opinions about the best IVF protocol for you and go do it. And be sure you've done more genetic testing. You've done the carrier screen, it sounds like, because you ruled out Fragile X. The only other thing that I would do for you and your husband is to look at a chromosome analysis to make sure we're not missing anything. And for those of you who are listening out there, miscarriages are so, so common. I'd like a miscarriage revolution as well in this country. Rather than assuming that the reason why the miscarriages were abnormal, wouldn't it be nice to just have a piece of paper that says what the abnormalities are for each of them so that you know that we're not missing anything? So it's easy to just say, oh, it's probably abnormal. But I think as women, we like answers, especially in 2021 and beyond. We would like to know exactly what the abnorm abnormality was. And that's what genetic testing of pregnancy tissue can do for you. And so I'm constantly talking about that. And I hope that no one who is listening to me right now has a miscarriage. Obviously, I don't want anyone to have it, but it is part of the, the normal human experience for so many people who want to have a family or grow their families. And so if you're listening to this right now and this has happened to you, know that you can ask for genetic testing of your pregnancy tissue if your pregnancy is large enough. This next question is from Elena in New York. Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 32, mother of one who's considering freezing eggs or embryos. I'd like to have another baby, but for personal reasons, we would wait to have another five years before we do that. So I'll be 38. I'm nine months postpartum with no return of my menstrual cycle because I'm breastfeeding. Is egg freezing something I should do or is it just silly and aggressive given I have a child already? I'm just so on the fence because it does come with risks. Thank you so much. So Elena, the biggest risk of freezing your eggs at 32 is not needing them. Of course, it's an emotional process. And of course, I don't want to minimize any potential risk from any medical procedure, but the likelihood of a complication resulting in any harm to you is going to be less than 1%. So I think the biggest risk of going through egg freezing for someone who's 32 who wants to wait until they're 38 is not freezing enough eggs mm -hmm, versus not even needing your eggs and having wasted your time because you got pregnant naturally at 38. Wouldn't that be great? 38, wouldn't that be great? I am so funny with all my rhyming today. But, um, but my recommendation to anyone who is 32 years old, who wants at least two kids to consider egg freezing. And the thing is that at 38, it might be too late. So having embryos or eggs would be great. Okay, this next question is from Zara in Illinois. I'm around 33.8 years old and I've been on letrozole for two months, five milligrams per day. In the last month, I used estradiol Valerie as well. 
four milligrams per day from day 10. I'm very stressed and I want to get pregnant fast. Do you recommend HMG and letrozole and HCG for the next cycle? I've been trying to conceive for seven to eight months. My AMH is one FSH5, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, DHEA, all normal. Would metformin help me? Thanks millions. Actually, Zara, I'm looking at your DHEA sulfate level and it looks like it might be a touch high. So I would ask your doctor to repeat it and see what it is. And then, yes, I would consider metformin if it is high, because that can bring it down. So my recommendation in someone who is almost 34 years old, and I don't know how many kids you have at home. I don't know all your tushy stuff. Is the tube open or the, is the sperm sparkling? Have you done all your genetic tests? If all that stuff looks good, maybe pursue one or two more of these cycles. And if not successful, I would go right to IVF because I'm thinking I don't want to waste time and miss out on an opportunity to help you get pregnant with your beautiful young eggs. And I also don't want you to miss out on an opportunity to have more than one baby because egg freezing, embryo freezing, that can also help preserve your fertility for let's say when you're 35.8 or 39.8. Because if we're already having the struggle right now, you can imagine that it will not get easier. You know that myth? Oh, I'll just get pregnant with that first baby and the second one will be easy. For some people, small number of people, that's true. And I want it to be true for every single person that has a fertility struggle with baby number one. But the reality is that almost always never happens. So preparing for the future is exactly what I would do right now. And if you're not successful, I would consider being a little bit more aggressive. And I do think a combination of Femera and Menopure, which is HMG and a trigger shot, that's kind of my approach for you. This next question is from Violet in Pennsylvania. Hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for answering all these questions. I just had a transfer that didn't work with a 3AA day five blast. I have a retroverted uterus and it was so difficult to get the catheter through my cervix. The doctor had to give the embryo back to the embryologist and work something through the cervix and try again. I read that difficult transfers have a low pregnancy rate. Could this be why my transfer failed? What can I do for the next transfer if I have a super bendy cervix? The doctor was already somewhat familiar from my anatomy, from my ERA and hysteroscopy. Also, I had to pee so badly that my blood pressure was sky high with a tilted uterus. Is a full bladder still necessary? So Violet, here's what I would do. I would try another mock transfer, not a mock cycle or a dummy cycle or implantation cycle with an ERA, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about just have your doctor practice with a catheter before transfer day. So one way to do it is at your lining check, just have them pass the catheter gently through your cervix. And if there's any issue, guess what? Transfer day, go to sleep. Don't worry about it. So that's one strategy that I've used successfully in patients who have a very difficult transfer. I'm going to know about it ahead of time, just so you know. So this is all going to be very well planned out. But I can tell you if you're asleep and you're relaxed, I can tilt your cervix however I want. I can move the speculum however I want. And I can also fill your bladder however I want. And finding out the perfect bladder filling for you is something that you'd want to do before the transfer. So I hope those tips help you. And then take Valium if you don't already. I give all my patients Valium 30 minutes before the transfer to relax the uterus. And so that might help in your next transfer too if you guys choose not to do it under anesthesia. Okay, guys, this next question is from Victoria in the UK. Hi, Dr. Amy. We've been struggling with infertility for over five years. I'm 30 and my husband's 34, and we did four IVF cycles so far and three transfers. All three transfers ended up in biochemical pregnancies. Our doctor advised us to do some genetic tests. All came back normal with an exception of the MTHFR test. My result is as follows, MTHFR homozygous. Can you explain what this means? Is it more related to blood clotting or is it the inability to absorb folic acid? I'm confused. Thank you. Okay, Victoria, here's the thing. As long as you're taking folate, which is in almost everything, I imagine it's almost in everything in the UK too, the likelihood that you're not getting enough folate to cause something called hyperhomocysteinemia is really, really low. However, I like to think outside of the box in cases like yours. And sometimes I just do a little something, something on top of what we already do. High dose folate, aspirin, 81 milligrams daily, and then maybe Lovenox. I know other people will be like, why the Lovenox? 
but it's still something I would like to consider in a case like yours. At least talk about it and see what we think and see if it's something that we would like to do. I'm not sure if you've done genetic testing of your embryos though, so that could be the reason why they resulted in biochemicals. It could also be from a hydrosalpinx, tubal issue, adenomyosis or silent endometriosis or obvious endometriosis, a chromosomal issue for you and or your husband, cavity issue like a uterine septum, uterine polyp. So these five things are all things that you can consider having evaluated. It sounds like your doctor is very much in tune with the tests that you should do because they checked your MTHFR. So I would talk to them about everything that's in my angel method, like your AMH, your FSH, estradiol, do them all again, maybe consider doing IVF again, but this time test the embryos and see if they have normal chromosomes and ask your doctor what the quality of the embryos were for each transfer, right? Embryodiamonds.com, the I is implantation rate, because sometimes embryos turn into biochemical pregnancies because the quality was on the low side and they don't have a high chance of implanting because of it. Okay, this next question is from Rachel in Canada. Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 37. I had a miscarriage six years ago after one and a half years of trying. After that, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Last year, I had two unsuccessful IUIs, and last month, IVF with four embryos. I transferred one today. My hormone levels are okay, but I'm worried if I need to have extra medicine because of Hashimoto's. I'm not a doctor, but I feel like taking Claritin will help calm my immune system. What are your thoughts? So Rachel, easy, test, don't guess. Get your TSH level checked. See what your levels are now. That's something that I would do. TSH, free T4. Checking your thyroid levels will give you the additional reassurance you need to make sure that you've balanced your thyroid as you're entering your pregnancy phase, hopefully. Patients of mine, I'll check your thyroid level when you start estrogen. If you're someone who we've been playing around with your thyroid medication, then I'll check again at the lining check appointment to make sure it's still good. And then believe it or not, yeah, I know, I know. Eight days later, after transfer, I'm gonna check it again. And then if it's still nice and stable, I won't check it again for probably four to six weeks. So get your thyroid checked. I wouldn't necessarily think that Claritin would play a role in helping you conceive after a transfer, given uh, with Hashimoto's, it doesn't really, it's not a tool in my toolbox, but it's not necessarily something that you shouldn't take if your doctor says that they recommend it for you. Next question is from Deirdre in Los Angeles. I'll be 40 this year and my husband will be 39. We've been trying to conceive for two years. After going through all the standard fertility testing and everything coming back normal, we referred to a fertility clinic. We decided to go straight to IVF. I have one ovary, uh, sorry, I have both ovaries and one tube from an ectopic nine years ago. First and unsuccessful IVF cycle details, 13 eggs, nine egg seed, seven fertilized, four embryos sent for testing, and all of them came back abnormal. One of, one of my concerns with the current clinic is the doctor never talked to us about embryo banking until after. We were completely blindsided and devastated. After spending $30,000, we decided to take a break and we'll retry in April, but are on the fence about going back to the same clinic. We're both eating healthy, going to acupuncture, taking your supplements, working on reducing stress. Do you have any suggestions for help with the next round or any clinic recommendations? So Deirdre, I'm not sure where you went, but I can tell you there's so many great fertility doctors in Los Angeles. You can't really go wrong. I love Catherine Deogarte, Dr. Guyana Ambersumian, Dr. Uh, she's in Orange County in LA, uh, Dr. Caroline Alexander. I mean, literally the list goes on and on. So my thought process though, is to go through again. I know you guys all know it. Embryo diamonds. Make sure we're not discarding embryos that could be potentially normal. And what I mean by that is mosaic. So mosaic embryos, especially if they're low mosaic, have a pretty good chance of turning into healthy babies with normal chromosomes. I know, quite a concept, but I think we've learned more and more about the power of genetic testing when it comes to embryos. And what we've learned, it's a murky crystal ball. So I don't want you to be in a situation where you didn't know this information. So be sure to find out if any of your embryos are mosaic before you discard them. And going into your next cycle, it sounds like you have a really good chance and really good obviously is relative to your age at 40. But if any 40 year old has a chance of having a genetically normal blastocyst, it seems like it would be you. So the things that I would do in a case like yours is, you know, talk about, you know, focus on all the like lifestyle stuff that I always talk about. 
and then also introduce NAD as a supplement, high dose CoQ10, have a good prenatal with fish oil, vitamin D, add HGH to your cycle, even consider acupuncture, look at sperm DNA fragmentation, and um, I think that you're going to be in good position to be successful, hopefully. And I always tell patients who are 40, it might take four cycles to even get one healthy embryo, and that is so common, and that's normal to get zero to one normal blast because each blastocyst has about a 20% chance of being genetically normal at 40. And it's not like, oh, if I just get, you know, it's like one out of 20 or something like, it's not how it works. So you can have 20 blastocysts and painfully still not have a single normal. And I've had cases like that where it's like negative, I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing. And all of a sudden, four cycles, like three normal embryos. I'm like, why couldn't I have gotten that the first time, right? Hmm. We'll never know. Well, you guys, thank you for joining me tonight. This is super fun to talk to you. I love answering your questions on Ask the Egg Whisper. I noticed that you guys have asked me a lot of questions tonight. So I want to be sure to answer them and I'll answer them as long as I still have a voice. Well, maybe just for a little bit because my stomach is growling. Let's see. I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to take another drink of my, this is my Dr. Amy cup here. The nose is to scale. Okay, let's see here. Do, do, do. Okay. Let's see here. Um, a recent blood test revealed I have high levels of anti-TPO antibodies in my system. My naturopath thinks I have gluten or dairy intolerance. I was wondering your thoughts on this. So I would say if I'm not an expert on something, I'm not going to say what I think. But I can tell you in general what I think is I haven't noticed that those antibodies are related to having gluten or dairy intolerance. However, I have heard really smart thyroid doctors saying if you have Hashimoto's, you should avoid gluten. So maybe that's a thing. Maybe there is a connection in your situation. But I would check your TSH and free T4 first before I get too worried about avoiding gluten. Okay, this next question is, oh my God, I hope you can answer my question on life. <laughs> live? Oh, live. This is live, you guys. Hi, I'm live. This is live. Duh. I'm having a, I'm scheduled to have a dental implant this weekend, but waiting on my PGT results. I'm scared that the surgery could interfere with my implantation. Um, so I would say it just depends on how badly you need the surgery. And if you're scared, you know my rule, if you have doubt, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't transfer your embryos. If you think your dental surgery will somehow impact implantation, wait. Easy. Okay. Um, would anti-TPO affect or cause thin linings? No. Or poor egg development? No. Dr. Amy June, today after four years of trying, I graduated from my fertility clinic. Do you know any OBGYNs in San Jose you can recommend? Thank you very much for all your sparkle. I do. I love Dr. Suzanne Bavone. B-O-V-O-N-E. She is awesome. Next question. It's gonal F-225 and menopure 150 considered a high dose for a first IVF cycle. I'm concerned about OHSS. I'm 40, AMH 3.5, follicle count 18. And my answer to you is that is a really good dose. That's actually pretty similar to what I would do in a case like yours. I actually might go up by 75 units. And it's because I want every single egg. I'm not so worried about OHSS because we have lots of things that we can do to prevent it, like Lupron trigger, bromocryptine, um, Femera, Ganarel, like there's so many things that we can do to prevent it. So the goal is to get as many eggs as safely as possible without causing OHSS. And if you're concerned, ask your doctor to get seen a day earlier, a day sooner. So if you're a patient of mine and you're like, Amy, I'm worried about OHSS, I'm like, don't worry. Come in a day sooner, come in a day earlier, and we'll get you checked out so we have time to decrease the dose. And then you can feel really reassured you'll sleep well at night and you're not going to worry. Next question is, um, let's see here. I was mid-40s with mini IVF, finally had a PGS normal embryo. I had a biochemical loss with no health issues diagnosed. I did an ovarian rejuvenation and a DNC for my linings and my hormones improved threefold. Awesome. Let's see here. Is a small dermoid cyst something to worry about after successful egg retrieval before a frozen embryo transfer? And the answer is no. If it's small and it's been there for a really long time, I wouldn't worry about it. 
Other than a sperm issue, why else would ICSI be necessary? I'm starting my first IVF tomorrow and ICSI with assisted etching is in my protocol. Thank you for all you do. That's a really good question. And the thing is this, if you've never had a pregnancy before, how do we know that fertilization isn't an issue? Even if the sperm sparkles, there could still be a fertilization issue that could be egg driven, sperm driven, or a little bit of both. If you were at, let's say, a university and they're like, oh, this would be great for us to really figure out if it's a fertilization issue, you can do half ICSI, half non-ICSI, and then see what happens. But see, you're not an experiment. You're a person that's gone through fertility struggles, and we really want to solve that by helping you have embryos, and sometimes doing ICSI will increase the number of embryos. However, if your sperm truly sparkles, the count's over 50 million, the motility is over 50%, and your morphology is totally normal, then maybe skip ICSI, but then realize that if it doesn't work, next time you'll do ICSI, and you don't, need, you don't want to be annoyed by that. Let's see here. Hi, Dr. Amy. Can you recommend a fertility doctor in Connecticut, please? I have no sense of direction. Like, I think I know where Connecticut is. I'm just kidding. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Wang, W-A-N-G. I love him. I think he has an office in Connecticut. Um, hello, dear doctor. I had only three eggs and two of them became my boy and girl twins. My humble question is, did one egg hatch one day and the other the next? I think I heard of this from the nurses, but I wanted to know. Hmm. I'm not sure I'm, I'm understanding that. So you had two eggs and you had two embryos and one was a girl and one was a boy. So I don't think there was any um, splitting of one embryo turning into two. Uh, let's see here. Hi, Dr. Amy. To reduce the risk of premature ovulation, my doctor suggested to take cetratide in the morning and evening before trigger day. Is it okay to take twice a day? Absolutely. If your doctor thinks that that's what they need to do, that's something that I've done as well for my patients. What do you think is the best trigger shot? HCG, Novarel, or Pregnol? So what you're saying is, do you like um, Motrin or Ibuprofen or Aleve? They're all the same thing. So HCG is HCG, and Pregnol is brand name of HCG, and Novarel is brand name of HCG. Ta-da! The only thing I care about is the dosing, and the dose of the HCG depends on the patient's body size, number of follicles, previous history. That's how I make the decision on the dose. Hi, Dr. Amy. On day seven post-transfer, but negative urine test, should I be worried? I'm going for my beta on Friday. And it's so hard because, um, you know, I actually test all my patients on day eight post-transfer. And I have to tell you, I actually have had a few patients over the years who tested at home day seven negative, and they were positive, very, very positive on day eight. So if you're worried and you can't wait until Friday, guess what? Ask your doctor for a blood test tomorrow. See what they say. Like I said, I test everybody eight days post five day transfer. I know 100% of the time, if it's positive, it's positive, it's a negative, it won't be positive in two days. So see what your doctor says so that you don't have to wait another day. Let's see here. Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm prepping for a donor egg cycle. Can my fertility issues affect the healthy development of the donor embryo? And the answer is, it is possible if your fertility issues had anything to do with endometriosis or adenomyosis. I've heard that ICSI and PGS can harm embryos, especially for over 40, as eggs may be fragile. So far, I've tested all, but now I'm wondering, should I hold off from PGS, ICSI in the future? So that's a really good question to ask your doctor. Every doctor will know what they should do in a case just like yours and let the embryos guide us. So if I have a poor quality embryo, I can tell you I'm not going to biopsy it. I'm just not, because that doesn't make any sense. If it's really, really low quality, but there could be a chance that it can turn into a healthy pregnancy despite being really low, we're not going to touch it because that's not fair, right? Like, why would I damage an embryo? But in general, if you have a good to fair embryo, even a slightly poor quality embryo, doing that process of putting it through a biopsy and freeze should not damage it. Um, let's see here. Do you recommend sperm fragmentation testing even before IVF, even if you plan on getting the embryos genetically tested? And the answer is yes. If the sperm DNA fragmentation is higher, the chance of having genetically normal embryos goes down. Your implantation rate also goes down. And guess what? There are things that you can do to improve sperm DNA fragmentation before you go through IVF. Why are low-grade embryos frozen if they aren't recommended to transfer? Is the main risk low implantation rate or higher risk of miscarriage? It's actually both. Lower-grade embryos, you know, we never, like, I never leave an embryo behind. You know what I mean? It's like no man left behind. And so if there's even a 1% chance that an embryo can turn into a healthy pregnancy, I'm going to test it. I mean, not necessarily test it, but I'm going to freeze it or I'm going to transfer it for a patient because I just, I, that's just what I do. I'm trying to help people have babies. And I know that there are a few babies actually around here that are named 1%, literally, like I can remember her name. 
it's 1%. Um, her name is not really 1%, but I can think of a really sweet nine-year-old right now who I called 1%. And what I mean by that is I told the mother, this embryo has a 1% chance of turning into a healthy pregnancy. And 1% is now nine years old. She's adorable. You would never know that I called her that, that name of 1%. But my point is that sometimes poor quality embryos can turn into gorgeous embryos. And sometimes gorgeous embryos turn into a negative pregnancy test. So that's the thing. It's kind of tricky. But at lower quality embryos do have a lower chance of pregnancy. That's why I named her 1%. Because I've never really seen an embryo of that quality turn into a healthy pregnancy. Okay, what is the largest size you let follicles go for IVF? Can the lab tell if they are post-mature before freeze? And the answer is yes. There are some physical characteristics that you can see in eggs. And I've grown eggs really juicy. Like some patients, I have to grow them to like 22, 24. I've even had 26 millimeter follicles that I've retrieved before. Dr. A, is it normal for blood pressure, blood pressure to spike during hormone treatments? The answer is for some people, yes. Number one, going through fertility treatment, so stressful. Hard to sleep, super anxious, lots of stress. Okay, so squeeze your buns every time you get your blood drawn, or at least think of me saying that. Number two, micro meditations. Number three, deep breathing exercises. Number four, mantra, inhale courage, exhale fear. Repeat after me, inhale courage, exhale fear. That's Dr. Caroline Alexander's mantra. I'm stealing it from her, but I'm giving her credit for it at the same time. I think it's brilliant. So you got to remember that. <sighs> My nose is kind of stuffy. Not COVID though. Okay, next question. A fertility specialist told me that HGH was very expensive and a waste of money since not proven to do much. I hear you suggest it all the time. Can you explain why you like it? I like it because IVF is very expensive and I want to do everything for my patients to just do it once and then be done with it. And HGH is about $400 a vial. So if $400 can give me a chance of having one extra embryo, I can tell you it's worth it. Anecdotally, in my experience, I have seen it help. I've had patients do two, three cycles without HGH before me, then they come and see me and we add the HGH and voila, we have gorgeous embryos. Was it me? No. Was it the HGH? Possibly. Was it just luck? Most likely. Um, but at the end of the day, when it comes to IVF, each doctor will have their thing that they really believe in. So if your doctor doesn't think that it's worth it for you to do it, that's okay. But we all have different opinions. Uh, next, see here. Symptoms of a biochemical pregnancy. Um, there are really no symptoms. It's just a test that you do called HCG for that diagnosis. Okay, prepping for FET on estradiol patches. What should the lining be before the progesterone starts? So my preference is 9 to 12 millimeters, but a lot of doctors are okay with anything above 7. Does PGS testing trump morphology? The answer is yes, right? So normal embryos rank them based on their morphology, right? So that's what we do. Dr. Amy, do you always need surgery to take out cysts? I want to start IVF if I have cysts. It really just depends on how big they are and what they are, right? So if they're really, really big and you're symptomatic from them, take them out. If they're really, really small, you've had them for years, like a tiny little dermoid, leave it. I took DHEA supplements and I'm on prednisone and my AMH went from 1.4 to 2.3 and my kidney BUN went up to 22 and my B1 creatinine ratio went to 24.4. Do you think it's from the DHA supplements? I'm not sure, but I don't, um, DHA and prednisone aren't tools in my toolbox that I give to my patients. So I don't have an experience seeing patients with an increase in AMH and change in their kidney function. But any change in your kidney function tells me whatever you're doing, maybe stop it. Um, is Lupron really bad? Can it help shrink cysts? And the answer is Lupron's not really bad. It's a medication that we use that for lots of indications, it causes horrible side effects, don't get me wrong. And it can shrink cysts, especially if it's endometriosis. Um, the, uh, let's see here. I've heard scary things about the COVID vaccine symptoms. Will those symptoms affect pregnancy? And the answer is um, sore arm. I tell my patients to you know, pre-treat with Tylenol. If you have non-pregnant patients take NyQuil so that it, the soreness doesn't keep you up at night. It can also treat a fever if let's say you develop it at night, but otherwise taking uh, Tylenol around the clock can help. Um, okay, you guys, I love you. Thank you for joining me on tonight's Ask the Egg Whisper show and for hanging out with me so that I can hang out and read your live chatted questions. Tomorrow, what day is it? Tomorrow's Thursday. I'm not going to be here. 
And then I know you know what the next day is Friday. And on Friday, I won't be here either. Saturday, won't be here, but guess what? I will be back here on Sunday to answer your questions. So if you have a question, send it in to asktheegwhisper.com and I will be here to answer them. So I hope the rest of your week is amazing and awesome. I hope you wake up in the morning saying, I'm gonna carpe the F out of this DM, just like I do. And I hope you guys fly through the day and remember that fly stands for first love yourself. You deserve every single amazing thing that comes your way and do whatever you can to treat your mental health, your anxiety, your depression, any relationship with issues that you have right now. Take a break if you need it. Breaks are really, really good. There's no such thing as an IVF emergency. There really isn't. The emergencies out there are like ectopics, miscarriages suck, but taking a break if that's something that you need is something that everyone should really consider doing. So hope you guys have an awesome night and I'll see you guys on Sunday. Love you all. Good night.